And everybody said, Please. Say an amen like you are happy you came to a Bible study. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And when you come, you come with joy, you come with expectation, and you come with your heart open, and you, whatever you've left behind, you leave that behind, and your heart, your ears, your mind, everything is set on hearing the word. Let the people of God say, Father, we thank you for the Bible study today. We thank you for your word. Every time we come, your word is to prepare us, build the enablement of the Holy Ghost in our lives so that we can be prepared for meeting you on the final day. And while we're still here before Christ comes, every step we take, everything we do, every word we share, and the life we live will bring glory to you according to your word in Jesus' name. The psalmist said, I put the Lord always before me. And Lord, we pray that you will be central in our lives. And everything we learn, we look at you, we look upon you and have your grace in our lives so that your heart will be happy, joyful with your faithful people in Jesus' name. As we come today, we pray that your word will enrich our lives and the grace to carry out what you are teaching us, you grant to us every time in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Another good, good headquarters. Amen. God bless you. Consider we're coming to Daniel today. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 8 all to verse 21. But I just read the two or three verses now from that uh, passage. Tonight we're talking on the power of an uncompromising life. The power of an uncompromising life, we can even say the proof of an uncompromising life, the profit of an uncompromising life, the power, the enablement, the energizer of the uncompromising life. We're looking from Daniel chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 8. In Daniel chapter 1, reading from verse 8, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he would not defile himself i'm sure you know that verse you've read that verse and you've heard that verse interpreted for you before but look at this it said he would not defile himself can i tell you that that is just an aspect of the life of a true believer we cannot say i may believe because i don't do this this one not that one not that one not you see here was the aspect he was just bringing out he proposed in his heart he would not defile himself of the wine that's not the totality of of christian faith with the women that's not the totality of the Christian faith. And with the worldliness, that's not the totality. It's not just what you do not do. What do you do? It's like somebody says, I don't hate. Do you love? I don't lie. Do you tell the truth or just keep quiet? I don't drink wine. Do you drink water? You cannot live on what you do not do. I don't, I don't, I don't tell us what you also do. In the life of Daniel, we understand his life was not based on, I don't drink this wine. I don't eat this meat coming from the table of the king. But we know he drank water. 
but we know he ate i don't eat this but you have to eat something i don't go the opposite direction you have to go the right direction and it is both the negative what you don't do and what you do that makes the sum total of your christian faith and we'll see here that he lived the life he was a prayerful man i don't drink wine you can't stop there I pray, I trust, I believe, and then I focus my attention on the God of heaven. I trust him, I believe him. It is that the negative I don't, the positive I do, is all that combining together that makes the real character of the believer. Now, it tells us in verse 20, look at verse 20, it says in verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding, you see that, he had understanding. If he only depended on, I don't, I don't, I don't, and there's no wisdom, and there's no understanding, and there's no positive actively living for the Lord that does not make a true believer it says in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them he found them ten times better that's the prophet of the uncompromising life that's the partnership with God of the uncompromising life that is the consequence of the uncompromising life the Lord knew about it and the Lord blessed him and the Lord showed that what he was doing was Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that they were profitable profitable to the God of heaven because it revealed that there is a God in heaven who blesses his own people it also showed that there is a God in heaven that has connection with man on earth here that when we stand for him he stands by us he supplies our need he makes us higher greater different from all the other people around us it says he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in in all his reign tonight we're looking at the message the power of an uncompromising life we're dividing this to three parts number one the decreed foundation of an uncompromising life the uncompromising life cannot hang in the air the uncompromising life must have a root must have branches and must have the foundation on which that uncompromising life is built the decreed foundation of an uncompromising life number two is the disciplined focus of an unconfined loyalty you know it's possible for somebody to say one day i will not i will not then you see so the other people drinking they say okay you're a believer you don't drink and you don't eat and all that and then they eat it in such a way they are saying this is the sweetest thing they have ever tasted on earth and then the fellow if you're not if you're not a kind of rigid and disciplined in your life you say am i not missing something in life look at all these people they are taking this and i'm saying i will not in your office when you see other people and say i'm a christian i can't go that direction in your um, community when you see other people i'm a christian i cannot do that and then you see the people the people of this world they're prospering and they are making progress and they are sending their children here and there and they are celebrating what they call success and then something is asking you are you not losing out are you not missing out because you know these uh, people of the world look at oh, i will not i will not i will not he is married now and he has three children and you are still there i'm waiting for the will of god many people they regret they say maybe i should change my mind but in the case of daniel he had a disciplined focus i'm not doing it because tomorrow 
I'll be higher than them. I'm not doing it because maybe in one week's time, this what no, it just that this is my faith. This is my conviction, and this is where I am going. He had a disciplined focus of an unconfined loyalty. His loyalty to the Lord was not dictated by, I have this, I get that, I have that, and all. everybody looks at me and they respect me. What if they don't respect you? What if they say, the man is queer, the man is odd, the man does not have any relationship with the rest of the people. He is not sociable. And what if you hear all those uh, criticisms against your life what are you going to do in the case of daniel whatever they said whatever they did however they looked at him in whichever they may in whichever way they may criticize him he had a disciplined focus because he had unconfined loyalty to the lord number three is divine favor of our uncommon Lord, our Lord, He watches everyone, He sees everyone, He knows everyone, He knows our thoughts, He knows our utterances, our words, He knows our action, and He's watching. And when He sees a person who has an uncommon stand, an uncompromising stand, and a stand that glorifies the Lord and the Lord alone, He gives favor, the divine favor of our uncommon Lord. Let's come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the decreed foundation of an uncompromising life. Look at that verse 8 again. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Do you see the personal words that are used there? Whatever others do, do you, Daniel purpose in his heart he would not know what is in the heart of every other person but he said no other man woman might heart and no other policy of anybody he lives his life I live my life in his heart that he it's not a man that is watching like a chameleon. If the color of the surrounding is this, I take that color. If the principal in that office, before I came there, this is what they do. This is what they do. And then they call me and they say, now you have come. How are you going to live? How are you going to carry on? This is how we do each here. And everyone that comes here, it shall forget Bible. It shall forget doctrine. It shall forget everything is hearing from the pulpit. Here is how we do our thing here. No, he said he, whatever others do, would not defile himself, himself with the portion of the king's meat. They would say this is coming from the king. For some people, finished. And sometimes they would say, this is how the pastor wants it. Go and check up. And the pastor wants it like that, if it's not scriptural. And they will say, this is how the authority, the higher authority, this is how they want it. Go and check up. Go to that authority as a human being. How do you do it like this? The Bible says, if they say, uh, uh, don't quote scripture here. This is high authority here. You'll be able to tell whether you are consecrated, committed or not, and whether you are a compromiser or not. But he said he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, no, with the wine which he drank. You know, many people are following heroes, heroes in the sports world, heroes in politics heroes in institutions and once they say this is what the hero does and this is what the respected personality in this community this is how he lives and this is how she lives the people forget their own conviction they forget the Bible. They forget that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. 
the hero worship. But when they told Daniel that this is coming from the king, in fact, this is the wine that the number one in the world, the emperor, Nebuchadnezzar the king, this is what he drank. He said, that does not matter to me. I do not hero worship. And then he said, therefore, he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. There are three things we're looking at here. Look at number one. Number one, the sure foundation of an uncompromising life. Uncompromising life has foundation. And we need to check up what is the sure foundation of an uncompromising life. Number two, the shaky foundation of an uncommitted life. I wanted to live righteously, but this is what they say. I wanted to go straight, and I wanted to be transparent, but they say transparency does not work here. If you're going to succeed here, and if you're going to be acceptable here, here is the way you will live. You so that the foundations are shaky because they have uncommitted lives. Number three, the sanctified fortitude that the courage, the sanctified fortitude, a man, a woman, a believer that has, uh, you know, the right attitude, the right heart, and the right disposition unto the Lord, the sanctified fortitude of an unconquerable life. You'll be unconquerable in Jesus' name. In this new year, when you walk, you become an individual. An individual that knows when I was born into this world, born alone. When I was born again, it was a personal relationship between me and the Lord alone. And when I'm going to leave this world and I'm going to face the great beyond, you will go alone. Therefore, you make sure that your life is personally committed unto the Lord. Let's look at number one. Number one is the sure foundation of an uncompromising life. In Isaiah chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 16. Therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion in the foundation of the Lord. He, the Almighty God, I lay in Zion a foundation. And then it says, a stone. He says, a tried stone and a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation that he that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth shall not make haste. There are people who hide themselves. Actually, they, they want to live right. They want to build on the sure foundation, but they are timid. And they are fearful. And if anybody is coming that will watch and say, This is what they are doing, they hurry up and then they go to another way. They don't want people to see that this is where they stand. But do you believe in God? Have you repented of your sin? Have you been converted? Do you have a new life in Christ? Aren't you going to allow your light to so shine that people will behold and see your good works and they will know this is where you stand? How can you be in a place for two years, three years, and people don't know where you stand? Anytime they want to bring in the message or discussion of religion, John, you find a way to escape. You make haste to go out there because you don't want them to know where you stand. Okay, let's ask Mr. So-and-so. Let's ask Miss So-and-so. Let's ask Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, Mrs. So-and-so, where do you stand? Uh, actually, I, I believe in God and I don't want to go further than that. The other religion to the believe in God. And the other, the traditional people, they believe in. Why don't you go further and say, this is where I stand. I pray that from today, you build your life on the sure foundation. And then it says, he that believeth 
and keeps on believing, he shall not make haste. Look at the next verse there in, it's in Luke chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 46. In Luke chapter verse 47 in luke chapter 6 reading from verse 47 here is what it says whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them i will show you to whom he is like whosoever in any denomination in any church uh, there are some people uh, they don't really have foundation uh, they say uh, I, i'm considering which church i will go and then eventually they, they look there they look there and where they are not preaching the word and the foundation is not laid solidly it will give them permission to live their lives and to do their dancing and to look at fleshly things and those immoral things and there is no discipline there there is no correction there is no checking up why did you do that why did you do that and they say i, I think this place will be comfortable for me there are people that they're just going to church they come here they tell us they are born again but they don't want to stand by the word of God you need to have the sure foundation which is the word of God let me come to the preachers themselves to the pastors and they want number 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 and they want the number to be increasing and you see that if they see that they preach the word of god one day then they look at the attendance the following day and they see that many people it's like they didn't come uh, that uh, you know the other days the message on the sure foundation uh, that was not okay for them uh, then they don't come it's, they have not left the church but they just want to show the preacher that you know it, if uh, holiness is the order of the day now if sanctification is the order of the day now we're not coming and then the preacher will see that place is country that place is empty and then he will come and he will say you know god loves everybody and whoever you are whatever i said the other time whatever i said the other time don't mind that is that why some people are not coming go tell them that now i understand i'm going to say what they want saying what they want will not take anyone to heaven but establishing the sure foundation and telling the people this is the way walk ye therein whosoever cometh to me and hearing my sayings and doeth them and doeth them it says i will show you to whom he is like look at verse 48 in verse 48 he is like a man which built an house and he did deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood arose the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock and jesus is that rock the word that has given us the word on repentance the word on salvation the word on holiness the word on sanctification the word of a qualification to get to heaven that the foundation on which we build our lives it tells us in second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 19 in second timothy chapter 2 verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure whatever others say whatever others think whatever others believe the foundation of God standeth sure having their seal the Lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity depart from iniquity that is the foundation of the Lord you're coming to Christ you leave and you depart from sin you come to the Savior you depart from iniquity and you come to our Redeemer and when you depart that means you repent that means you abandon your sin that means you believe solidly on the Lord from your heart that he that shall believe in your 
heart that Jesus now is your Lord and shall confess with your mouth thou shalt be saved the foundation of God stand sure having the seal that it says that everyone that names the name of Christ will depart from iniquity somebody say amen we're coming to number two here number two is the shaky foundation of an uncommitted life the life is not committed to god the life is not committed to the scriptures the life is not committed to teaching and doctrine of christ and they have shaky foundation we're looking at psalm 82 and we're reading from verse 5 psalm 82 reading from verse 5 it says they know not neither will they understand they walk on in darkness all the foundations of the earth are out of course look at all the religions of the world and look at even those who say they're christian religion they, they are not departing from iniquity a sort of tradition and festival and ceremony and rites and you know whatever but it's because the foundations are shaky they're not looking at the words of jesus and they're not looking at this the standard and the sure foundation of the lord and building on therein it says all the foundations of the earth are out of cause it tells us in isaiah chapter 24 and we're reading from verse 18 isaiah chapter 24 verse 18 and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare for he for the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake the foundations of the earth not following after the sure foundation of the Lord, the foundation of Christ, the foundation that sees that a sinner is out of sin and is into the kingdom of God. It says the foundations of the earth, the foundations of religion, the foundations of denominations, the foundation of assembly, of fellowship, of this or that, and it just worship and worship, and the word of God is not given its rightful place those foundations are shaky it tells us in second Timothy chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 5 second Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 having a form of godliness those are religious people a form of godliness they mention the name of Jesus they talk about Jesus they talk about his birth they talk about his death they talk about his resurrection but they have a form only they do not have the nature of godliness they do not have the real transparent life of godliness having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says ever learning it's not that they don't read the Bible. Ever learning. They've been learning of salvation. They're not saved. They've been learning about repentance. They have not repented. They've been learning about the new birth. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. They're ever learning. But they, they are not born again. And they read about and they learn about the life of the Christian that follows Christ. It says they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth their lives and their convictions and their faith are not built upon the sure foundation of the lord shaky look at james chapter five chapter one i'm reading from verse six james chapter one we're looking at the second part of verse six it says for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss he that wavereth today what do you believe 
they say this is what they believe and then tomorrow what do you believe actually from experience if i say i believe in holiness um, i don't know i'm going to categorize that because i know it in the head but i cannot do it i cannot obey it. all the sins of the past they are pulling him down they're pulling her down all the temptations and the trials they make him to waver it says he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss then in verse 7 in verse 7 for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Even when he goes to pray for the salvation, he's not very sure whether this salvation will get him fully out of sin. And he's kneeling down there, oh God, save me and give me your grace and let me live a righteous life. Then he's remembering that man in the office once I see him, I don't think I'll be able to follow through on what I'm praying about no, that woman. Once I see her, I don't know whether I'll be able to contain myself and say, here I stand and I will not do any evil. That uh, money back man, that rich man, that rich woman, I don't know when I see them whether I can stand. They don't understand the power of God to take a man, to take a woman, take them out of sin, out of evil, and make them stand but you will stand I said you will stand but the man, the woman the so called church goer that is wavering here and there let not that man think that he shall receive anything salvation anything sanctification anything wisdom anything stable life he will not receive anything of the Lord we're looking at number three here number three we're looking at the sanctified fortitude of an on conquerable life the sanctified fortitude of an unconquerable life look at daniel chapter 1 verse 8 there it says but daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat that know with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself sanctified fortitude that wasn't his home country he came from another place from judah from jerusalem and they looked at him as a captive those captives that came from uh, judah and yet he could fit. he had never met this man you know some people you have a boss that you have never met you are meeting him for the first time and they have given you scholarship that you will read and study for three years here yeah? and they put him man in charge we don't know the stature of the man and the facial appearance of the man but daniel fortitude courage the courage of conviction he walked straight to him he wasn't just sitting at the back there saying how do i handle this problem what do i do very simple either to eat or not to eat that's it and then you have to tell the man you cannot get the food and give it to another person what you are not going to eat are you going to give to another person not only that what are you going to eat if you don't tell the people that i'm not eating this you might die of hunger but he had a sanctified fortitude of an unconquerable life let's look at um, uh, psalm 119 reading from verse 106 in psalm 119 verse 106 i have sworn and i will perform it that i will keep thy righteous judgment i have sworn to myself i have sworn to anybody who cares to hear I have sworn and the God of heaven has heard that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Look at 115 verse 115. It says, depart from me, ye evildoers, for I 
will keep the commandments of my God. I will come into 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 21. It says, If a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Then in verse 22, it says, Flee also youthful laws, but follow righteousness. Look at that. You flee the lost. That doesn't complete the Christian life. Flee also youthful laws. That's in the negative. Bring in the positive now. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Yet the people you surround yourself with, they'll be the people that also follow the way of the Lord. This way them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the companions of Daniel, they were towing the same line, believing the same word, obeying the same precept, having the same foundation. Now, if you say you'll not defile yourself with the idolatrous meat already sacrificed to the God of Nebuchadnezzar, but your friends, they eat it very well. They don't see anything wrong in it. And they're your companions. Every time they're eating it, you're looking at them and you're discussing and they appear to be enjoying Nebuchadnezzar's wine and meat. You will not stand because you surround yourself. You're intimate. You're conversant. You're familiar. And you hold your friendship with those people that will not follow the way of the Lord. You hold that intact. But you safely also youthful laws, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Hebrews 2 verse 11, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. You see that there's unity between the sanctifier and the sanctified. Christ is the sanctifier. You are the sanctified. If you are truly sanctified, there's unity between Christ and the Christian who is sanctified. Because it says they're all of one. And it says for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Then in verse 12, it says, saying, I will declare thy name unto the brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 13, verse 13 says, and again, I will put my trust in him. Again, behold I and the children which God has given me. And then in verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15 now, in verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage, fear of death, fear of death. Either they will kill the person or kill his progress or kill his happiness, or kill what he regards as something he cannot deal without. And because he feels that that man, that woman, has the power to kill, either to kill what he delights in, what he, what he wants, kill his progress, kill his vision, or kill him, kill the dreamer. Because of that... I will submit. Well, if you submit, 
They've killed the dream already. They've killed the vision already. What are you living for? Do you just want to live on earth? And then you are afraid. They'll kill my dream. They'll kill my vision. They'll keep my progress. And so they don't kill my progress. I will surrender. If you do that, you don't really have faith in God. You only have faith in your vision. Faith in your desire. Faith in what it is you are looking for. And because of that fear of death, all their lifetime, they are subject unto bondage. But when you understand that Christ will keep you alive, I said Christ will keep you alive. If that dream, if that vision, if that project came from the Lord, you will keep that project alive. Your progress, you will keep it alive. Your vision, your dream, you will keep it alive in Jesus' name. But, and Daniel did not have any fear. What if Daniel feared like the head, the chief of the eunuchs? Because that person said, I fear my, my king, that I don't want to die because he will see your face and it will be lean. Because of that, I fear, but you will not fear. I, I will not fear. Anywhere you find yourself, you stand on a foundation, the sure foundation of the word in Jesus' name. We're coming to number two here. Number two is the disciplined focus of an unconfined loyalty. The disciplined focus of an unconfined loyalty. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 9. It says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Then in verse 10, in verse 10, and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your meat and your drink for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort then shall ye make me endanger my head unto the king. Uh, well, you know the story already. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, others needless fear that cripples our scriptural consecration. Number two, our nurtured faith that compels only steadfast consistency. Number three, observe new freshness that confirms obvious supernatural consent. Let's look at number one. Number one, others needless fear that cripples our scriptural consecration. That's what we just read now. The man who was in charge of the food, who could take that food away, the idolatrous food, the idolatrous drink, who could take it away, said, Daniel, you know, I sympathize with you. And I kind of want to encourage you in your religious conviction. But you know, there's a problem here. I fear the king because he's uh, a king who supervises whatever he delegates to anybody. And he's he will look at you and look at the other children of your sort and people of your age and people like you. And then he will see that your face is lean and it's not uh, very good at all. It's like I am starving you. It's like I've been taking the food away and doing something with it and then I will endanger my head before the king and I fear for my life it will kill me you know sometimes you take a decision that this is the way God wants you to live and people who wants to control how you live they say no they fear that if you do that you might lose your job you say you go to them I want to make restitution. I want to set right what's wrong in my life because I came to that place of work with another person's certificate. 
they know that's the right thing but they fear and the fear is my friend if you go to do that you may lose your job how do you know they'll lose their job they say god in heaven he'll preserve your job in jesus name you're in courtship and then as you're in courtship you know something that you know you should tell the man maybe you've never had the normal condition of the woman as it goes with women and you know it every time you meet together you say you are in courtship if i open my mouth and tell this person now he will break the courtship how do you know he'll break the courtship then you go to a counselor and you say sir or mama mommy i have this challenge i have never done this since I was born. And as it goes with women, it's not like that with me. I'm in courtship now with a brother. And I think to be faithful, because he's telling me everything in his life, everything in his background. I think I should tell him, ah, the fear that that counselor has, he'll pass that fear on. My daughter, you know, if you do that, he will break the courtship how do you know that he'll break the courtship have you not seen brothers who say yes i hear that but god led me to you and god is able to solve the problem thank you very much for being faithful and you have told me and i'm still going to go ahead but the counselor with his own fear will put that fear in you that if you do that that's the right thing to do but you might lose this chance of marrying this man or in any other condition in any other case you've been careless you have done something you shouldn't have been doing and then the spirit of god is now checking up on you and he's saying look at this uh, this man you are walking with doesn't know that this woman you are walking with doesn't know that but look at this look at this look at this and then you go to see counseling somewhere to start with you have a bible you have the holy spirit and the holy spirit is saying this is the way walk here therein but you go to a counselor unnecessarily and then you say uh, pastor or our women leader i'm having this challenge what should i do ah, don't don't talk okay, just pray about it pray about it and forget it you pray about it your conscience is still knocking you your conscience is still pricking you and you know that this thing if you're going to get to heaven you must set this things right but then they put their fear in you that if you do that it will affect so and so it will affect so it may even affect me and so if you do that then many other people will suffer then you keep quiet and you are carrying guilt and condemnation in your life because of the fear of so a counselor but you know daniel just told him and said this is where i stand and although the man brought out his fear other people's fear did not affect him other people's fear will not affect you give me a good amen, amen. are we together i said are we together if you're a believer you'll be together with me but if you are not a believer and you are saying, okay, keep on preaching, I don't want to say yes to what I don't accept, you, will you not accept the word of God? You will. Look at this in Proverbs chapter 29, and I'm reading from verse 25. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. It may be your own fear, the fear of man, it's, it brings a snare. And the fear of that man, the fear of that woman, the fear of that authority, you don't have any Christian life left. Your life is not based on the foundation of the word of God. Your life is built on fear. It's built on the consequence of if I obey the word, if I do the truth, if I go the right direction, I fear this. You are a religious man, a religious woman. You are not a righteous man, a righteous woman. 
because all you think now is if I do it this way, what's the consequence? If I do it that way, what's the outcome? That's not Christianity. That is religion. It says the fear of man bringeth his near, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Somebody say amen. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy word. This is the reason why, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He was number one in the nation. He was the king in Israel. He was higher than all the people. And there are people, even though they have a high position in the church, in the denomination, yet they are living their lives on fear. It's like, you know, they don't really have any conviction anymore. What's the use of your quiet time? No use. What's the use of your prayer? No use. What's the use of your coming to church? No use. What's the use of saying, I'm a believer? No use. What's the use of your testimony when your life, the whole of your life, is based on, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. All this teaching you are hearing, you're not obeying. All the word of God were reading and explaining, you're not obeying. And once that man looks at you like this, you got the message. And once he, you know, comes and pushes you over the shoulder and saying, How are you doing there? I hope, I hope, I hope. All these that were hearing, you remember what I told you to do? then you are lost. I pray that this year will be totally different in your life in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and I'm reading from verse 27. Hebrews 11 verse 27 by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible let's look at number two there number two here is our nurtured faith that compels only steadfast consistency we're coming back to daniel chapter one reading from verse 11 then said daniel to melsa whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over daniel ananiah and over Mishael and over Azariah. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, prove thy servants in the plural. Now we know that Shekra, Meshach, and Abednego, they had the same conviction. Well, Daniel, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days and let them give us pause to eat and water to drink and then in verse 13 it says then let our countenances be looked upon before them and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat and as thou seest deal with thy servants look at verse 14 in verse 14 so he consented to them in his in this matter and proved them ten days them not just daniel alone he proved them ten days now you need to understand that it is not only the food we eat in the faith we have it's not only the meat we take it's the word we take that's what we're told in here in, um, in uh, matthew chapter 4 verse 4 in matthew chapter 4 verse 4 it tells us he and he answered and said it is written a man shall not live by bread alone 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it is the word, the word we feed on, the word of faith, the word of power, and the word of the Lord that we feed on that actually makes us who we ought to be. For example, you are living uh, together with maybe your husband and your wife. And uh, because you are together, you have to tell him, uh, darling, I want to fast tomorrow. Ah, be careful, be careful, be careful. Also, also, if somebody is fasting and fasting and fasting, my brother, she said she wanted to fast one day. And you have the fear in your heart that you don't want your wife to fast. That your children, they have some, you know, situation and they have some condition with the children and you've been praying and praying and no answer has come. These children are going from bad to worse and uh, your wife or maybe the husband, the husband says, is, I'm going to wait on the Lord for three days. Water fasting. I'll not eat anything, but I will fast. I will drink water. And they want to say, ah, my husband, be careful. Uh, the children, they have this condition. Don't let us kill ourselves because of, you know, this child. We have been praying, God will do it. God will do it. But your husband, that's a conviction. I'm going to wait on the Lord because of these children for three days. And the fear of, uh, you know, what will happen uh, to you. I don't want to lose my husband now. What's the problem? Three days. That, you know, the husband wants to fast or the wife wants to fast. We feed on the word of God. Give me a good amen. amen. I want to ask you, since you became a Christian, born again, child of God, have you fasted for one single day? Have you fasted for two days? Have you fasted for three days? Drinking water, drinking water, and then you are praying and you are quoting the word of God because it says, but even by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Did you hear what Jesus said? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now you are married, your husband will not allow you to fast like you used to fast when you were all by yourself. Now you are married and your wife will not allow you to fast just like you used to fast by yourself. Not only that, you are now the pastor of a church and then you decide you want to wait on the Lord, you want to fast, and people are checking up, is our pastor eating? Is our pastor eating? Is he not eating? And if, um, you know, they get the information, is we don't understand or present, it's not eating like you used to eat. Ah, is that so? Uh, they are fearful. They don't want their pastor to die, to die, to die. And the people that look at your scriptures, Paul, the apostle, and all those people in the sheep 14 days they are not eating anything and an angel appeared unto Paul by night and said Paul cheer up fear not because God has seen the condition of the storm and everything and has given you all the people that sail with you there are people they will not allow us to live our life the way we ought to live. Okay, do it this way, do it this way, and uh, they do it that way. Then, you know, the people who want to fast, they cannot fast, and then they have prevailed. You know, all those things is the fear of man. It's the fear that God is not able to take care of us, is not able to take care of his people. And the word of God, the word of faith, the word of power, and the word of the Lord is not sufficient to keep us healthy and sound and alive. I pray you'll have the mind and the courage to live the life you want to live according to the word of God in Jesus' name. Somebody is saying amen over there. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 6, If thou put the brethren, 
in remembrance of these things thou shalt be a good minister of jesus christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained look at verse 15 it says but meditate upon these things upon the word of god upon the example of daniel and upon the lifestyle of shadrach meshach and abednego and see how god supported them and how god helped them meditate upon these things and give thyself holy to them that thy profiting may appear to all we're coming to number three here number three is the observed new freshness that confirms obvious supernatural consent that god consented to what daniel had said and what shadak meshach and abednego what they were going to live on and so now we come to daniel chapter 1 verse 15 it says and at the end of 10 days their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And then in verse 16, thus Melza took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they should drink and give them pause. That means give them vegetable give them fruit give them what grew from the ground that's what he gave them and now when they checked up on them the their faces were better fresher that's what will happen to you can i explain something i said can i explain something now, when it says they were giving pause, that pause stands for vegetables, stands for fruits. And there are people that say, yes, I take vegetables. Yes, I take fruits. Uh, the challenge is, take carrot, for example. Everybody knows carrot. If you pick that carrot and you plant it, it will sprout. It will germinate. It will come up. It will bring more carrots am i right am i right if you take that same carrot and you boil it and you cook it well cooked and then you take that carrot you don't cut it just cook it and put it in the ground and say that you want other carrot that boiled carrot that you put inside the uh, soil will it grow no, you boiled it. If you take any other fruit and then normally by itself plant it, it will grow. Boil it before you plant it, will it grow? That's what people do to the fruit they take. You know, when you boil it, there's already so there are some chemical changes already, and there are some things that the life inside that carrot, inside that fruit, already the life is gone. And so, if you plant it, if it will not grow, when you eat that, all the nutrients that should have been in the carrot, in the vegetable, in the fruit for you, You've lost everything. You're just taking calorie. You're just taking something that will not give you the growth and the freshness it ought to give you. And so Daniel, Daniel understood that. And Daniel said, give us just this and then water. Actually, water is very important. There are people that eat and eat and eat and they don't drink water. But you know water, the brain is a lot of water the body a lot of water all the different parts of the body a lot of water and because uh, it's a lot of water you need water you need water for the brain you need water for the body you need water for um, you know every part of the body and so even though we're not um, you are not only depending on pores and water but vegetables very important and the fruit very important and the water very important and the Lord will take care of you. You will not die young. You will live a long life in Jesus' name. 
Now, we're coming, we're coming now to Psalm 103, and I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 103, we're looking at verse 5, who satisfied thy mouth with good things. Amen. So that the youth is renewed like the eagles. Your youth, youthful strength will be renewed in Jesus' name. And we're coming now to, oh, I said that to uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. It's not just the carbohydrate you eat, and it's not just the protein you take in, and it's not all those things you stop feed your body every time. The Spirit of God. That's the advantage we have. We who are believers, we're eating right, and we're drinking water sufficiently, and then also we have the Spirit of God inside us. It will quicken your mortal body. It will strengthen you. Uh, some of my overseers, when I go for GCK crusade, and when they say something, the people should, don't say amen yet. When they, that the people should say amen, and they say amen, then they will say, the louder your amen, the longer your amen, the louder your miracle. Yeah. You've got it. Miracle for you this year. The power of God for you this year. Because if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. When the Holy Ghost enters, cancer has to go out. When the Holy Ghost comes in and he says, I am resident here, I am going to stay there, all those diseases, they have to go out in Jesus' name. It will touch every vital part of your body and you remain alive and healthy and strong in Jesus' name. The spirit that raised him from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. The wine of Nebuchadnezzar cannot bring in that Holy Spirit within you that will quicken you. And the meat and the food sacrificed to the idols of Babylon cannot bring in that Holy Spirit which will quicken your body. And all the things the people of the world are eating. In fact, and they fry everything and all the nutrients and all the everything that should be there. They fried it up and the oil and everything and they're just taking charge. And all those things cannot bring in the power of the Holy Spirit. But you a believer you're eating right and you are drinking water very well and then you are prayerful that spirit of God will quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you this year you are well this year you are strong and every good thing you want you'll have the strength to go out and the strength to come in and then there'll be the protection of the lord upon your life in jesus name we're coming to point number three now point number three is the divine favor of our uncommon lord the divine favor of our uncommon lord we're looking at three things here number one the special favor of ten times better than our peers. You see Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were ten times better than all the people they went to that three-year course together. Their peers, their colleagues, they were ten times better. Number two is the significant favor of ten times better than our past. Understand, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they entered that school, they didn't know the Babylonian Chaldean language. They didn't have the knowledge of the Chaldeans. And so, when you look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they entered, and at the end of the, of the three years, and the king found them ten times better. 
10 times better than their peers, 10 times better than their past. What they didn't have, what they didn't know at the beginning of that course. Now, they knew so much, 10 times better than their past. Number three is the spiritual favor of 10 times better than our people. When you look at Daniel, and you look at all the Jews that came to Babylon, when you look at Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and you look at all the Jews that came to Babylon in the captivity, and you think about the understanding of the language, and the understanding of the condition of all the provinces of the kingdom of Babylon, and when you look at everything that they had, even they, they were better, ten times better than all the people of the Jews that came. Look at chapter 2. I just tell you, uh, the forgotten dream, nobody, whether the Jews or the Babylonians, could discover the forgotten dream. And when you look at chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that had the courage that if they go into the fire, nothing will burn them ten times better than all the other people. Nobody had that faith. And when you look at chapter for and now Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and the watcher from heaven said cut it down and this is what will happen nobody could interpret that to him but Daniel came and he looked at the king and said thou art that tree and the watcher in heaven is dedicated and, and delegated to cut down that tree you will go seven years seven times until the dew of heaven will fall upon you ten times better nobody could do that and when you look at chapter 5 and made him made it take a person and he came with courage and he said thou O king you knew what happened to your father and now this is what you have done your kingdom is numbered you have weighed and found wanting nobody else in the whole land could do that when you look at chapter 6 and it says if anybody prays to God all these months he'll be thrown into the lion's den and here comes Daniel and opens the door of his, uh, of his house and he prayed to the Lord three times daily nobody had that same kind of courage to be thrown into the lion's den ten times better than our peers, than our past and than our people and I'm praying for you that this year you will so walk with God you'll be better, you'll be better than all your peers in Jesus name and you'll be better than the past life in Jesus' name. And then all the people around you who are living in fear, who are living with compromise, you'll be better, much better than all of them in Jesus' name. Let's come to number one now. Number one is a special favor of ten times better than our peers. We're looking at uh, Daniel chapter 1, reading from verse 17. Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge. He'll give you knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams and then in verse 18 in verse 18 now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar verse 19 then he says and the king communed with them and among them all was not was found none like Daniel and Ananiah and Mishael and Azariah therefore they stood before the king promotion is coming for you Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it says, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that, that the king inquired of them, he found them. Tell me. Read it out of your Bible. Read it for yourself. Read it for this year. Ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all Israel. All those people, they went to school together and they had that three-year course together. They were ten times better. Ten times better. Where are you? 
your time has come. Yeah. Your brain will be better than it was before. Yeah. Your remembrance, I always forget. I always forget that this year you will not forget. Yeah. Because you'll be ten times better in Jesus' name. Yeah. Look at number two there. Number two there is the significant favor of ten times better than our past. We're looking at that Daniel now, chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom, all matters of wisdom, do you know you are going to have greater wisdom this year? Wisdom to deal with personal issues, wisdom to deal with family issues, wisdom to deal with, you know, the things you've not been able to deal with before. Greater wisdom is coming upon your life. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he said, he found them. He found them. No matter where you go to for interview, they'll find you. And no matter where you go for examination, they'll find you. And no matter who is communing with you, they used to discuss with you. And it's like what they are, what they are saying is like Greek. I don't understand. But this year, when they talk with you, new year, new brain. New year, new mind. A new year, new understanding in Jesus' name. And then it says, He found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the astrologers that were in all his realm. A new thing is starting right now. Look at Psalm 119, verse 99. Psalm 119, verse 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers say amen. amen Daniel went to school and then they gave them in the school somebody to teach the knowledge somebody to teach the language somebody to teach and those are the men of uh, the men of Nebuchadnezzar and they were real people that were sharp in knowledge in language and in everything but now Daniel became, he had more understanding than all the teachers that taught him in the three-year course. Where were those teachers? When Ebenezer had a dream and he forgot and none of them could bring that out. And then when it says that he had a dream and he saw that tree that was to be cut down, where were all those teachers to interpret the dream to Nebuchadnezzar? No, they could not. Daniel became wiser than his teachers. Daniel became, that was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, way, way wiser, stronger, mightier than all the teachers that taught them in the school. This is your time. Yeah. I said, this is your time. Yeah. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. Look at verse 100. In verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Number three now, we're looking at number three. That's the spiritual favor of ten times better than our people. And we're looking at um, Daniel again, chapter 1, reading from verse 19. In verse 19 it says, And the king communed of them, among them all, among them all, among them all was not found anyone like Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. You will stand in prominent, eminent places this year in Jesus' name. And when the letters of interview will come, and when you get the letter, and they tell you where you are to show up, you will not say, ah, in this kind of place. I've never been to a place like this. Yes, but you'll go there. But you'll get there. And then when you get him there, you know, the interview is not just what you say with your mouth. Your posture, the way you are respectful to them, but you are not fearful. And you see them there. And when they ask you any question, you are not looking down. He said, uh, I don't know the answer to that one. The only ghost in you knows the answer to every question. And then you look at them and confidently Open your mouth wide and Almighty God will fill your mouth. 
the proper answer will come out. And what others cannot do, you will do. Because it says now in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them like they will find you ten times better, ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all the land. This year will be a year of promotion. It will be a year of progress. And it will be a year of ten times better. Where are you? Stand up and receive the blessing of the Lord. Stand up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I thank you this year. And I thank you it's going to be a new year, a wonderful year. And all these promises we have given that were revealed to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be mine. They will be yours because God is a faithful God and He will answer your prayer. Open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord that this year will be a blessed year for you, for me, for everyone of us.